Good morning everyone and a warm welcome and good morning to anyone watching this service being streamed. I often forget to welcome them, but welcome to you as, to, as well, or watching a recording. Um, right, you may notice that I've gone on and on at you in the view sheet on the front page about George's ordination, because I'm really hoping for a good turnout from the St. Saviour's, uh, Saviour's congregation. Um, but already it's uh, factually inaccurate because I've just learned that Jane Ilton, our beloved Jane, was ordained here, gosh, probably about 30 years ago, uh, to the priesthood. So, so yeah, um, so actually ignore that bit, but, but please still come on uh, that Monday the 1st of July at 7.30. It will be a real celebration of the full church, lots of great music uh, and worship. Um, I'm going to have to disappear a bit more quickly than usual after service because so I'm, I'm leading the evacuees service at St. Albert, Albert's, just Albert's Pier. Um, so forgive me for slipping away a bit earlier than usual. Would you please stand? The Lord be with you. Our first hymn, hymn 209. To whom all hearts are open, all desires known, 
and from whom no secrets hide. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Confess together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have yes, sinned against you, against our own, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past. Grant we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Trinity, let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose <coughs> not our hold on things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings.
The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Job, chapter 38, verses 1 to 11. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea and with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far you shall come, and no further. Here shall your proud ways be stopped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is a reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 1 to 13. As we work together with Christ, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labours, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left in honour and dishonour, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true. As unknown we, uh, sorry, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. When evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. May my words and our thoughts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Please have a seat. The sad reality is people suffer. We don't need reminding. Indeed, it often seems um, that good and innocent and righteous people suffer, sometimes horribly, whereas the guilty succeed, the evil prosper. These simple facts of life have challenged every single religious tradition in human history. And they have all had something to say about human suffering, about what it means and where it comes from, and how we are best to deal with it. We want to know why, don't we? We want reasons and we want it all to make sense. The theological word for this paradox is theodicy. Now one of the answers that our tradition offers is that in spite of appearances there really is a direct connection between our behaviour and our fate. Good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. It's a very attractive way of looking at life because it appeals to our sense of justice. It offers an explanation that appears to make sense. Also this formula can be found in many places in the Bible. And perhaps subconsciously, we all carry at least a little bit around with us all the time. But it doesn't always work that way, not by a long shot. As much as we would like the universe to be clear and simple, the basic facts of our experience pretty much refute those claims. The evil prosper, the righteous suffer. There are no guarantees one way or the other. Which is where the book of Job comes in. The book of Job, which we don't get to hear from very often on Sunday mornings, and it's not really surprising because it is pretty depressing, but it offers a biblical perspective to suffering, which is an alternative to the more familiar approach. I'm sure you know the story. Job is a righteous person and he suffers terribly. All sorts of really horrible things just rain down on him and his family, and Job wants to make sense of all this pain, his loss and his humiliation. So he asks, why? Over and over and over. And bless him, Job insists on telling the truth. He's a good man. Several of Job's religiously minded friends come by to talk to him about this, and they all say different versions really of the same thing. They all insist that the world makes sense but God is fair, so if Job is suffering, it must be his fault. He must deserve it. And that is the traditional orthodox response. This is what religious people were, perhaps are, supposed to believe. But Job isn't buying the traditional answers. He says he doesn't deserve this, that he's righteous. And he then insists that if anyone is out of line in this whole enterprise, it has to be God and not him. He is angry at God, and I think there's a place for that sometimes. That's the truth as Job sees it and knows it, and he's not going to 
Let go of that truth as he sees it. No matter what his friends say to him, no matter what the religious tradition says, Job wants to know why. This is where today's reading comes in. After insisting that he's innocent and God is to blame, Job wants more demands to know why. And the Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind and says, as we heard Andrea read, Where were you? What God says to Job is not comforting, it's not reassuring, and it's not an answer to Job's questions about why these terrible things are happening to him. In fact, God never says anything at all about Job's troubles. Instead, what God says to Job is basically, I'm God and you're not. Which, at least on the surface, is not terribly helpful. Job already knew that. What God says, as powerful and as beautiful as it is, simply doesn't directly respond to what Job is asking. For whatever reasons, God simply does not give answers to questions like Job's. He just doesn't. And to me, this is something of a relief. Because any answer to this terrible question humankind have lived with would surely be inadequate. God is making it very clear he is not a transactional God. It's not true that if we put in a particular behaviour, behave in a certain way, then we are guaranteed a particular result. And actually, if you think about it, that's not a good motivation for doing good either. But what is most important for Job and his questions throughout the book of Job, and in fact for us, is not what God said. What is most important is that God spoke to Job. He didn't speak to any of Job's orthodox-sounding friends. God who somehow lies behind the whole created order, this same God reaches out to Job, that questioning and argumentative critic of his. God speaks to him and makes himself known to him. God seeks and offers relationship. Not answers, not quick fixes, not actually what Job wants, but relationship. It's enough, finally, and after much struggle to satisfy even Job. It's not the same thing as an easy answer, but it will do. God seeks and offers us relationship. That's what there is. That's all there is in this story. Something similar is going on in the story of Jesus rebuking the wind in the storm. In the New Testament, boats are almost always stories about the church, nave, the point here is that Jesus is always in the boat with us. The promise is not that there will be no more storms. The promise is not that the wind and the storm will always stop when we want them to. The promise is not that the disciples will always be safe. That's not the way it is, and Mark knew that perfectly well when he told this story. In fact, the disciples learned pretty quickly that they were not going to be immune from any tragedies in life. In fact, they seemed especially prone to tragedy. And for a long time, it looked like Job would make a perfect patron saint for the early church. But what the disciples of the church also learned early, and they never forgot it, is that wherever they were, and whatever was happening, they were not alone. Their Lord was there. He was with them, knowing them, and loving them, and never letting go. As with Job and the disciples, what the Lord offers us is relationship, his presence and his love. And not answers, even if we want them. Like Job, we have the ear of the one who made the cornerstone of earth. Like the disciples, we are never alone, no matter what happens to that boat or to us. If we look for that, if we look for the loving presence of God himself in the very heart of whatever is happening, we will find it. So no easy answers, I'm afraid, but the presence of God with us in the very heart of whatever is happening to us, and that should be enough.
Knowing that, then Paul's words in our reading from 2 Corinthians ring much more true. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. Amen. We stand to confess our faith in the words of the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, the light from God, true God from true God, begotten by the of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us, for our salvation, he came down out of heaven, was a triumph of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified and the conscious heart. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will die on earth. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the cross. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and other sort church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the Lord to come. Please sit or kneel for our prayers. Let us come before God with still hearts as we join together in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with our prayers, knowing that you will hear us, help us, and guide us. We pray for the worldwide church, churches here on our island, our dean, and all our rectors and leaders, and Bishop Stephen, who will be visiting the island next week. Help us to be like the Good Samaritan, who reached out to someone outside of his own religion and culture. May this example inspire us to go beyond our own comfort zones and help those in need, regardless of them being different to ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the world. Give wisdom to all people to understand the need of our time and to work for justice and peace. May those who hold power and authority in the present be ready to learn from the wisdom of the past. Today, we remember and pray for Malawi and the recent tragedy of the Vice President. For the ongoing war in Israel and Gaza and for all other countries around the world where there is war, suffering and hardship. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayers. Holy God, we thank you for the joy of human love and for all those among whom we live and work. We especially pray for our friends and families who do not know you or whose faith have been shaken. Help us all to see that we have an anchor in our Saviour's love. Give us grace in our families, neighbours and friends and let each generation value what the others have to give. 
Lord, in your mercy. Father God, we bring before you all those who are passing through illness. We ask that you bring healing to their bodies. Today we spare a moment of reflection for the lives of David and Sonia Parker, Katie and Mark Serka, Sylvie Marquis, Daphne Noel, Reg and Marion Hugay, Carl and John Giorno, Derek and Debbie Paul, Ruby Atkinson, David Bishop, Ray Kitchen, Simone Kinman, Sheila Garnham and Alfred Hall. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. Merciful God, we remember those who have died and those who are saddened by their passing. Today, in a moment of reflection, we remember and give thanks to the lives of Mike Noel, Leslie William Anderson, Anne Erskine, and Marjorie Wilson. Lord, be with the bereaved in their loneliness and give them the faith to look beyond their present troubles to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who died and rose again and who lives forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we begin this week with you, give us a grace to remember you in every moment of the week. Help us to seek your guidance and honour you in our thoughts, words and actions. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please stand for the peace? Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. We offer one another a sign of Christ's peace.
goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. 
as we offer you this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving.
God, comfort of the afflicted and healer of the broken, you have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and peace, that all the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the Son, In number 235, omitting verse 2, omitting verse 2, 235, omitting verse 2. and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So we have a birthday, and <laughs> we've got very good intelligence operatives out there. <laughs> There's no escape. 
29th? <laughs> <laughs> and no <then> pre-season? <laughs> Love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.